I'm Nicholas Orme, the author of the recent book, Tudor Children. Why write a book about Tudor children? One reason is that nobody ever has, despite all the uh, amount of books that have been written about every other aspect of Tudor England, if you think of the royal family or naval history, exploration, politics, society, drama, and so on, but not children. There is a reason for this, and that is because the history of childhood before, say, the 19th century is very difficult to reconstruct. It's a question of looking at every possible source, whether it's literary or visual or archaeological, and gathering little bits of information and then piecing them together like a mosaic to make up a picture. That's not something that you can give a PhD student to do. And most people have found it easier to uh, spend their time on a, a more uh, concentrated subject where the, the sources are very obvious. But it's always interested me throughout my life uh, to collect little bits and pieces. In my youth, I was a stamp collector, and some of my enemies might say, well, he's never really done anything else but do that. So I had a template in mind because I'd already written a book on medieval children. And in fact, I conceived this at the beginning of COVID as something I could do during COVID because nowadays a lot of the source material is online and during COVID the libraries and archives were closed and so I couldn't uh, go to them. And I roughed out uh, a scheme of the things that I wanted to cover, obviously how children were born and, and uh, how they were looked after in the first year or so of their lives. Um, what advice was given to mothers before birth and what um, understanding there was about children's diets and, and um, sleeping practices and their, their care generally. And then I went on to think about childhood at home and how a child grew up in a family in 16th century England, um, how large families would have been, um, there was, by modern standards, a considerable amount of child mortality in the past. And at one time in the 1960s, it was fashionable to consider that the emotions of parents towards children would be different in the past because parents were likely to lose children and therefore couldn't... Um, bond emotionally with them. That turns out to be uh, entirely wrong and such evidence as we've got about parents mourning for their children shows that they did indeed and were uh, very grieved uh, by their loss just as uh, parents would be today. Then I thought about how children would have played and this turns out to be a very big subject. It is probably the richest aspect of this topic that um, there are all sorts of games ranging from things you do with your hands, uh, little um, toys that you play with. And there was a, a toy industry, in fact, in the 16th century, making dolls and little metal figures, metal um, implements and, and the like, um, bowls and cups and uh, uh, cupboards, and things of, of that kind. And then there's all the, the, the card games and the games you play with um, little things like Five Stones and um, Diamonds Morris. And then there are the active games, of which there are a lot as well, including the ancestors of football and, and tennis. <laughs> uh, then it was a religious age, so I had to consider how children were brought up in religion and this turned out to be interesting because in fact the church authorities and the um, 
and the secular authorities did not actually insist on children going to church, although they encouraged it. It's not until you pass the age of puberty that you are considered to become an adult, and therefore you have to um, uh, fulfill religious obligations. But children lived in a religious environment, and so they, they picked up uh, a good deal about uh, how church worship was organised. And of course, that changed enormously during the 16th century. And children probably adapted to it better than adults did, in fact, so that the children born after the Reformation adopted it, whereas um, adults who were rooted in pre-Reformation Catholic religion were much um, uh, slower to uh, abandon it. Then there was the question of going to school, and it, the older I get, and school history is one of my uh, abiding interests throughout my life, there's far more schooling, far more literacy in the past than anybody considers. And um, I found doing my research for this uh, references to um, an ostler and an inn being able to read, and a, and a, a, a maid in a in a, in a household um, and so a lot of children go to elementary education far fewer to any secondary education learning latin but very many going to um, uh, school to learn the alphabet and, and to do absolutely basic reading and then there was a question of what other culture children would have had i mean play was obviously one aspect of culture but then there are the things that uh, our children uh, like, or at least like before the invention of mobile phones, like reading, uh, nursery rhymes, songs, that kind of thing. And there turn out to be quite a lot of evidence about this, about stories that they read, um, tending actually to be ancestors of the comics of my youth, the stories of Robin Hood and um, Evans of Hampton, Guy of Warwick, uh, tales of Daring Do, romances, um, nursery rhymes, popular songs, quite a lot of evidence for those, one or two, three blind mice, um, ding dong bell, pusses in the well, these actually um, are found in, in Tudor versions. And then last of all, I considered how children would have grown up. When did they stop being children? Um, this again, 50 or 60 years ago, was considered to be very early. But when you think about it, a child can't do proper work until they pass the age of puberty. So although they'll be doing tasks around the house or around the farm, light tasks like um, needing animals, uh, say, or bird scaring, it's only when they reach puberty that they can um, do agricultural work or indeed uh, get apprenticed and learn to do craft work. And then in their teens, they go through the period that we all go through of um, bonding with um, others of their kind. Um, and so you get quite a lot of evidence about um, teenage boys and their goings on and their, their, their collective disturbances. And then, of course, uh, finally, they begin to uh, open themselves to the opposite sex. And there's the question of sexual relations and social relations across the, um, uh, the, the, the sexes becomes uh, a matter that you can study as well. Um, how do I summarize it all? Well, there were children. There were actually more children as a percentage of the population in the 16th century than there are, are today. So we're talking of somewhere between a quarter and a third of the population because people died earlier. Uh, they're there. Um, and yet um, people have not... They're there. <clears throat> and yet People have not really looked for them. So almost all Tudor history is adult history. And what I hope my book will have done is to put the children into the picture as well and to say, well, OK, they were not in authority, but they were there. They had needs. They had wishes. 
And these did actually have uh, an impact on what Tudor England was like. 